I, I wanted to say uh, uh, thank you all and uh, uh, and uh, thank those of, uh, those of you who are responsible for bringing me to Aarhus again for an extended residency. I think this is my, over the years, uh, maybe a decade and a half, my 12th trip to Aarhus, <laughs> but it was always for a day or two at a time. So now I have a deeper sense of what your conditions of life are like. <laughs> and, and quite enjoying it. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here in <clears throat> Aarhus again. And also, I, uh, just as a prefatory, uh, a couple of prefatory things. One is, um, wherever I am in this exposition, I hope it's far enough along to be intelligible. And I'll just, if I'm not finished, uh, I'll finish quickly and stop within a half an hour or 35 minutes. So we do have the time for the discussion because that's kind of my benefit in giving the talk. Uh, second of all, um, I'm, as I talk with Niels, uh, it's fashionable today to present talks without PowerPoint. But I'm not fashionable in this regard. I forgot my, to put my PowerPoint on the thumb drive, and I didn't have time to redo it. So these runies, as you said, this runic type writing on the board is some of the stuff that would have just been clarifying on a PowerPoint. And uh, the third thing before I sort of launch into something like a, a formal talk is to say that uh, the context for this is I'm, I'm working toward a, a small book on collaborations and, which is the title, but I would also use the word and interventions uh, uh, in the uh, evolving forms of ethnographic research. And I'm very interested and I think how they impinge on uh, the classic uh, method culture of field work, which I think is more uh, a culture than a, uh, if, if you want, it's a culture of method more than a kind of uh, 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 a formal kind of guidebook or text. So I think the implications for anthropology are great because I do think that the ethnographic field work complex are not only the way that anthropologists develop knowledge, that's at the core of contemporary, at least cultural and social anthropology's identity. And um, um, I'm looking at how uh, collaborations and interventions are imperatives more than kind of choices of method, and how they reshape uh, not so much the way we think about what anthropologists do in the field, but what constitutes the field itself. And that there are continuities, of course, with this in, in the evolution of my own work from writing culture to multi-sided ethnography, for which I didn't have good answers at that time. This is the mid-90s of what this would mean for field work. I, I think a lot of people felt it would uh, thin it out. Uh, it would make it less deep. It would, so there's a whole ideology of doing field work that's in question. In, I think in good and productive ways I'm talking about this issue of collaborations and interventions. And uh, none of these, these are words which I come to use in special ways, but they're also very common words. And that can be operate against me. So collaboration and intervention has a myriad of meanings, uh, everyday life meanings, words you're familiar with using. And I'm not going to give them special abstract meanings. I'm sort of using them in a special way, nudging them in a special way in the kind of argument I want to make. And the danger is, of course, that it will come back to the, your sort of everyday associations with them. Uh, so let me, with those provisos, begin. And of course, I'll begin with, because I can, with something in the, the, that goes back to writing culture, which is actually in its, uh, that it's been 25 years since writing culture and anthropology's cultural critique. <clears throat> but it was an ambitious critique of anthropology by means of what I would call literary therapy applied to its primary genre form. Issues of politics, the claims of anthropological knowledge, and what exactly is translated in field work all became matters of experiment with a rather modest textual form that became, classic ethnography was not an ambitious textual form, 
it was hard, as a textual form, it was rather modest, that accommodated, uh, that became richly overburdened for a time, and then settled into new conventions that accommodated rhetorics of argument, doing theory in a general so-called reflexive term, which I do think still dominates the field ever since. It's come to mean it's had many growths and branches and means many different things. But I think the lasting impact of writing culture was to uh, license, uh, it, not even experiments now, but a certain kind of re reflexive framing of ethnography in a, in a project of critique or critical project. So I think now that's not experimental, that's kind of orthodoxy. This uh, legacy of experimenting with forms and has now shifted to and blended with contemporary challenges to constituting still mostly individualistic projects of ethnographic research. And when you think about it, ethnographic research, although it's concerned with the collective, with society, etc., is in its kind of form a profoundly individualistic enterprise. Uh, so still mostly individualistic projects of research in a more globally organized world in which field work must be constituted other than locally. So that's the bind. Far from being matters of new method, about which anthropologists have been famously implicit and unspecific, these challenges are once again about the forms of knowledge, but now shifted from texts as reports from the field to production of media. You could say web texts, forms of collaborative thinking, articulations, concept work amid data or as data within or alongside the field as the latter has changed its character. And modes of making them accessible to multiple constituencies including the professional one. So the ethnographic text, either in the form of the article or the book, is still what we do. But it's under question. And it's in that space of its questioning that I'm at, considering the, the idea of new or, or emerging or different kinds of ways of making ethnographic knowledge and making it accessible. While the latter trend might be seen as a mainly a result of the spread of new information technologies, the vaunted digital revolution, it would be a mistake without underestimating at all their significance to miss the continuity of writing culture's concerns with critique through experiments with basically discursive forms in the same impulses today to find ways, media, and modes that mesh ethnographic discourse itself within anthropology's reinvention of fieldwork as a process of inquiry. So in this re-identification of the concerns of writing culture in the present, I want to identify two tendencies. <clears throat> One is that the kind of already shadowed the forms of scholarly communication, or at least in the ecology of the present expansion of digital possibilities and how these are affecting the ethnographic genre of research and writing. The book remains important, of course, ethnography, but in a different ecology which favors various sorts of commons. Now, Chris Kelty has written about this as the function of composition as a key form of ethnographic process based on its collaborative collective grounds. What does the book or its related productions, for instance, the scholarly article, out of the ethnographic process become within this ecology, this commons ecology? Some of the exemplars of new forms that I will mention arise as a function of trying to situate ethnographic research today in this ecology and developing embedded, accessible expressions of it in the process. And then the second factor I want to deal with very quickly is, to a certain degree, there has been an involution of form in the writing of ethnographic accounts, a certain settling in of theoretical influences as dictating writing practices and leading to what I would think of as a Baroque form. Notable ethnographic accounts are often marked by tendencies of excess in descriptive and theoretical ardor and a desire to surprise by tropes of unusual juxtaposition. Less Baroque forms of ethnography must find their richness, I argue, outside now established theoretical traditions of critical ethnographic writing, the orthodoxies of reflexivity, and the appeal of alternative forms of articulating thinking, ideas, and concepts inside or alongside 
the challenge of situating and managing the field work process in what I will call third spaces, archives, studios, labs, parasite, and the like. Now, I love great ethnographic text, so I'm not uh, uh, somebody saying, oh, abolish the beauty of ethnographic writing. I'm only pointing out that the licenses of the writing culture period gave rise to uh, a kind of canonical Baroque form, over-elaborated form, with various problems. But that's a separate kind of uh, critique. I'm just noting it along the way. The discursive thinking produced in these forms along the way of field work is not, this is what I'm talking about, can be exposed in parasites, uh, archival forms, these other forms that I want to talk about in their possibility, parasite. This discursive thinking produced in these forms along the way of field work is not especially anti-theoretical nor overly pragmatist, but foremost open and sensitive to found perspectives as sources of its own ideas and its own language of commitment to argument or critique. The use of critical cultural theories from the 80s and 90s is a means of creating an often ancillary apparatus for a kind of found and direct concept work in design spaces of experiment and intervention alongside the valued serendipity of fieldworks, movements, and circuits. Whether what I'm talking about conflicts with or is in line with classic norms of fieldwork is something that we could discuss and debate. Most acutely, the, ethnic, the ethnographic process become transitive and recursive in addition to being already deeply reflexive. Writing culture within this process moves from the filled notebook, which is usually in anticipation of the eventual text. The relation of filled notes to texts are something that is this is a topic that's being interestingly written about now. So I've learned a lot from reading uh, these kinds of reflections. So uh, writing culture within this process moves from the field notebook in anticipation somehow of the eventual text to certain accessible if not public forms of concept work and critique in the protracted phase segments of many field work projects today. It is experiments and attempts at these kinds of forms that I've been especially interested to examine today as a legacy of the 80s writing culture debates in their displacement within the terrain of ethnographic inquiry that is conventionally categorized as method. So the writing culture debates were mainly about text, but they had a good deal of implication for what field work is about. And what I'm arguing is there's an aspect of the writing culture debates that have now moved into the question of what is field work, right? Uh, or how to position or establish field work in a much more complex world. So I give a little bit of an historical background here, and I'll indulge some of that here. Neil's helped me out in giving the introduction. But after the 80s writing culture debates that play, that put in play a paradigm of critique for anthropological research from, say, the early to mid-1990s onward, Anthropology in the U.S. had then to rethink itself, and did a num as did a number of other disciplines, in relation to the perception and reality of macro social changes that went out under the rubric in the 90s of globalization. As a discipline, I mean, we still talk about globalization, but it was a kind of theoretical and conceptual object to talk about, not just in academia, but a lot of places. As a discipline, it had to work through knowledge economies, global projects of political economy, what are sometimes termed assemblages or circulation, to find its way to both its traditional and new subjects at the ethnographic scale, face to face, every day. So to position yourself in field work in the 90s became, I think, a different sort of, and you're looking at new and emerging topics, became a different problem. I want, to, I want to argue. This task was more than just recontextualizing or re-narrating the scenes or locations where ethnography could be done. It meant literally moving in scapes or flows, reinventing the concept of the field, reproblematizing the traditional object of study, and exploring new ones. How, to what degree anthropology actually did this, it's up to your own opinion. But this was a very strong push in the 90s. 
This collective thinking was reflected at the time by a spate of resident, what I would call trend writing, people sort of diagnostic writing. In the US, for instance, works such as A Potter Eye, uh, by Anand Singh at that, during that period, by Bukhtan Ferguson, and uh, my, several others, and Niels mentioned my multi-sided piece, which was 95, but about the same time as these other kind of diagnoses. About the recalibration of the scale and meaning of the basic tropes of anthropological research methods so as to set them in motion. The diverse and fascinating ways that the trends envisioned in the 90s as the challenge of globalization to the previously more circumscribed ways of conceiving projects of ethnography have played out through the first decade of this century and continuing as a problem of designing fieldwork and its practices in, through, and between complex institutional orders. For instance, the, uh, a key expression of this for me around 2005 is the volume by, edited by Ong and Collier, <coughs> Global Assemblages. This for me is an iconic text, but there are many, I participated in it, but there are many others like it, of the ethos of ethnographic research during this period. It's a kind of post-globalization thinking about what globalization became in the first decade of the century, what implication it would have for actually doing field work in these, if you want, neoliberal spaces. Okay? Now, conditions for ethnographic research glimpsed or evoked in the 90s are now full throttle trends of research practice to be examined as experimental moves or improvisations project by project as they are reported in ethnographic writing still dominated by critical theory as they are evoked in the shifting terms of tales of the field. I haven't done this research, but I think if you've listened to stories of field work, they're quite different now than they were in my youth, <laughs> and even than they were in the 1990s. So, tells, so symptomatic is how people talk about field work, what kind of stories they tell in the field. And I think they're more integrated into the uh, systems with, with, in which they're implicated. So de development anthropology still doesn't provide the means to locate you somewhere so that you can do the anthropology that the discipline tells you to do. But you actually have to negotiate yourself into the field, and that affects what the field, it, uh, field work is, what you actually do, where you move around, who you talk to, who become uh, key, key informants in the old language, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm very interested in taking a close look at this in, a, in discursive ways, not just as the mythos of method in, in the discipline as they are evoked in the shifting terms of tales of the field, the particular kind of shop talk in which anthropologists like to indulge about their trade craft as they are caught in graduate mentoring, and most importantly as they are, as they are reflected in, in the alternative media and forms, notably collaborative, through which access to both field work and, it re, and its results in development is made available. In broad brush, I am particularly interested in, now this is not all projects, but these are kind of, Project, it, it, uh, Niels mentioned that uh, in, in a way, if you dealt with, dealt with traditional categories, you might think, well, I'm not talking about most anthropological tool, I'm talking about work with elites, work on policy, work on uh, large organizations, institutions. I would argue that these things mesh, that most people who do medical anthropology today, for instance, moves through the larger, sometimes neoliberal projects of philanthropic capitalism in a way, and that the, the, the big projects today of philanthropic capitalism have a, a, a deeply uh, a, a social rhetoric or discourse, and which may or may not be heartfelt true or even result. But in negotiating progress, projects, you have to, uh, it involves a different kind of politics of uh, establishing the field of field work. And so it matters in terms of how and where you wind up in the classic field that we imagine in which we do our work. So in the imaginary of field work is tremendously influenced by these negotiations, by these embeddings in other projects today. And I'm not uh, saying that old field work must be defended. I think there is a lot of incredible new 
kind of ways of working in anthropology, true to its past or its convictions, in, 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 in facing up to this kind of politics. Uh, as rather than just satisfying the funder or gaining the opportunity to do our thing, it changes what our thing is. And uh, uh, not to make it more neoliberal or whatever, uh, or not to change uh, the value of, uh, of ethnographic research, but it does change the conditions of doing it. And that, and it's the kind of dynamics of that that I want to, a, a, a consciousness for that that I want to talk about a little, or I want to advocate for. In broad brush, I'm particularly interested in projects that have to work through complex knowledge economies to shape their own anthropologically conceived objects of study. Projects in which the balance has shifted from previously marked epistemological interests in defining ethnographic research questions by the intense examination of anthropologist others' inner subjectivity to a marked ontological interest in the problem of conceiving complex objects of study. In this, anthropology's participation in science studies has been crucial in conditioning it more generally to working through knowledge economies to sites of everyday life. So there, while we had the problems of globalization all these cited, there were some new fields, uh, conglomerate fields that emerged uh, in the late 1990s and established themselves into the 2000s that are not everything for anthropology, but became very important models for doing contemporary work anywhere. Science studies, uh, the, what came off of it was the anthropological study of finance. Uh, the, the great thing about both of these fields is they don't know what their boundaries are. Suddenly they find themselves you know, in traditional studies of exchange in New Guinea. Uh, suddenly they find themselves in medical anthropology, uh, the, the basic topics and debates of medical anthropology but they provide new pragmatic context for them, or changing context for them. Now, in commensurately, the reflexive turn instilled by 1980s critiques of ethnographic writing has been overshadowed, as I mentioned, by a transitive or alternatively recursive turn. Anthropologists move in circuits, assemblages, or among relations as working metaphors for defining the field. And they move situated discourses that they accumulate around with them in unusual configurations. This movement and posing of arguments out of the places where they are usually made, heard, and reacted to, it's like taking local knowledge, if not global, uh, around the networks, are distinctive acts of ethnographic fieldwork that are political, normative, and sometimes provocative in nature and deserve their own design modalities accessible to readerships, audiences, and constituencies who consume ethnography as a form of knowledge. In a sense, in, indeed, ethnography has routinely become, what I use the term, which was kind of misunderstood and unfortunate, uh, circumstantially activist. Not so much as a contingent effect of the unfolding of research as multi-sided, but rather as, a, as central to its strategies of asking and pursuing questions amongst its constituencies, including and encompassing activist social movements, jurists, humanitarian interventions, international organizations, and for that matter, corporations, agencies, and labs as well, but always in the name of a distinctive tradition and form of disciplinary knowledge. I think the marker of this emergence that I'm talking about pragmatically is anywhere anthropologists go today, they must work through, around, or in facing up to in the world of NGOs, which inhabit essentially, thoroughly inhabit the space that traditional anthropological fieldwork wants to establish. Uh, NGOs have been around for a long time, but it's the, the major modality of this sort of more abstract system that I've been characterizing. The visions and tropes of the 90s have thus become plans, designs, and technologies for giving form to field work in the present. The classic ethnographic textual form, even as amended since the 1980s and given its learned pleasures, is a very partial and increasingly inadequate means of composing the movements and contests of field work, both naturalistic and contrived, collaborative and individualistic, that motivate it and on which it is intended to report. The alternative 
are middle range forms of collaborative articulations in the course of inquiry that need in turn trials and experiment under the mantle of disciplinary recognition and authority. These developments are indeed underway and my own vantage point to explore them is from within the Center of Ethnography, which I know, uh, that since its founding at the University of California has been, in 2005, has been interested in studying the conditions of contemporary challenge to an enhancement of common understandings and disciplines, not only in <coughs> anthropology, that promote and value ethnographic inquiry. Say, for example, at the time of the 1980s writing culture critique, as well as before and after, in the unfolding of projects of ethnographic research, whether pursued as the initiatory pedagogical, we've been very interested in how dissertation projects emerge now, as the initiatory pedagogical dissertation project, or as successive later projects in maturing research careers. Generally, the first field work is never, never repeat that again in the contemporary world. You become more immersed in applying field work and ethnographic techniques to a much more diffuse and complex research problem after uh, the dissertation. You might sort of say the Malinowskian model is designed for training nowadays, and that the actual research model is something much less, not, not as well articulated, right, in, in anthropology. It's kind of lived, tells a field work about, but that's the kind of, uh, uh, but if you want a secret society, we're all a member of. The following are six conditions which shape ethnographic projects today and to which the center has paid special attention. In my own view, such conditions are significant in encouraging experimentation with the discursive forms of collaborative thinking enmeshed within or alongside the pursuit of still largely individualistically conceived projects and so forth. And I wrote those on the board and I have a bit of a discussion of each of them, but I'm going to foreshorten them and just mention them and we can elaborate any of the ones that you're interested in. Just they, Once again, they're not uh, special language. They're, they're not abstract concept creation. It's just using common terms to uh, talk about the characteristics of this space. Uh, one, and the, the key one that was of interest to the center and has been and why I'm writing a book on collaborations is not just the impulse to collaborate. Anthropologists have always had the impulse to collaborate, but it's been stifled in, in, in our own norms of method for various and interesting ways. There's been histories of field work written which shows it was a collaborative uh, imaginary in the beginning. And then because that didn't work out for a variety of institutional or other reasons, you know, for rivers and stuff, it became the individual model and then forward. But at any rate, the impulse to collaborate is deeply embedded in a highly individualistic practice. But I, I'm interested also in the imperative to collaborate. Collaborate is, is uh, collaboration is the flexible form of the neoliberal order. Collaboration is the form which gets academics and others involved in uh, often market related or uh, oriented uh, market-oriented forms of, of research and humanitarian projects. Uh, it's where a lot of uh, funding comes from, and it's very sophisticated in what it asks for. So there's an imperative to collaborate that I don't think anthropologists who have the impulse to collaborate would always be very comfortable with. So it's very political. But I'm very interested in this more, this politics and these norms of collaboration <coughs> and how they affect what field work can be within a certain kind of sponsoring framework. And I, I mean all kinds of field work. Uh, so, um, two is double agency. We all know it's an everyday thing that we understand ourselves in ways that the others don't understand us. <laughs> I mean, other academic disciplines, et cetera, et cetera. All disciplines have this sort of internal language you know, what's a real economist as opposed to the way. But the anthropology has always been uh, a proudly marginal discipline. And therefore, it promotes within the rational or the hyper-rational uh, ways of thinking that are incredibly therapeutic for the rational and the hyper-rational once they're open to it. 
But it gives this idea that when you're doing work, you actually operate in terms of uh, 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 double discourses. And we accept that. So, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody who was here for the conference on Wren. And, you know, the message of anthropology to e e economic models of carbon markets, et cetera, is, you know, we told you so. So the point is that an anthropologists have a kind of double agency when they write fund proposals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To work in collaboratories, this idea of double agency, rather than just noting a kind of professional uh, fact of professional life, becomes a kind of interesting mindset. So it's one of the things I th th think about in redefining or redacting in book. Third, in its way of being interdisciplinary. <coughs> Third, reception and granular publics within fieldwork. We cultivate certain publics for our research, certain constituencies for our research. You could say fieldwork is, it's not such a matter of what site you're working in, it's who you're working among. Who, who you are addressing uh, and who responds to your work, but often it's very much ringed within the framework of an ethnographic study. This, this one has to do with the recognition that in this assemblage world that your constituencies also have stakes that have implication for your own work in much larger arenas. So the idea would be to produce the ethnography, not you know, for a public at home, and uh, maybe your subjects will read it, or you'll have a special kind of relationship, intimate you have know, relationship with your subjects in terms of what you produce. This sort of merges that boundary, and that the people you were working among, after all, are members of larger publics who you might want to address somewhere elsewhere, but it's the recognition that publics are granular now, and that the stakes of the people that you're working among very often, even though that might be a frame for the questions you're asking, impinge on your, on your work. And there are many examples of anthropologists who, you know, used to work in Guatemala and now work among Guatemalan activists. And so, but this is a, a, a clearly linked <coughs> activist the framework, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about almost anywhere you work today. So it's the recognition of the constituencies you're working with in the intimacies of field work as part of larger, granular parts of larger public, and you have to rethink what the products of from field work are and what how these create opportunities for reception. Of, those constituencies as larger public. So this leads to a number of interesting material questions about what to do in field work. Four is incompleteness, uh, incompleteness and scale. I thought of this in the late 90s as issues of complicities rather than rapport. It's the idea that you're always dealing with, of course, incompleteness. But it's how you deal with that incompleteness other than it's sort of explaining it away or apologizing it away. So incompleteness becomes a, uh, the idea that you are the agencies of which are determining things where you're working or elsewhere, and that you share an awareness of this with certain uh, subjects. And this creates a kind of complicity rather than rapport. But incompleteness and scale is a, is a major issue in thinking about these mediating forms. Temporality of emergence, it's a kind of escaping, not from the burden of history, but the, the burden of historical narrative as being the natural frame for ethnography in the present. So various ways of thinking about emergence temporally, re, reposition ethnographic work. And the sixth one, each one of these have their own discussion, I just mentioned them here, is in the center, the and for why this is so historically, I don't know, the appeal of design and its affordances. Not so much to create the, the relationship with what design does in its research, various forms of design, how design is positioned in terms of these powerful projects that I was talking about, how anthropology or ethnographic work can work in alliance with or in relation to uh, 
design methodologies, design thinking. Uh, some of the forms that I'm thinking of, these middle range, third space forms, which I want to talk about, are, are actually forged in design context, studios, labs, uh, impose themselves on natural settings or arise out of, nat or are constructed out of natural settings by research in them. And so there's a lot that I think this kind of, uh, that ethnographic field work can, in the idea of creating these middle range forms between field work and the text, or field notes and the text, can learn from design. And there's a whole discussion there. So <clears throat> just let me say that the, um, So, third, third spaces is a, an important middle. Uh, My, Michael Fisher influentially posited during the early 2000s that anthropology now operates in a set of third spaces in which anthropology's challenge is to develop translation and mediation tools for helping make visible the difference of interest, access, power, needs, desire, and philosophical perspective. He goes on to say that these third spaces are terrains and topologies of analysis of cultural critique of ethical plateaus, which is a special terminology that he has. They are dramaturgical processes, fields of action, and deep plays of reason and emotion, compulsion and desire, meaning, make, uh, meaning making and sensuality, paralogics and deep sense, etc. My sense of the course of many projects of ethnographic search, research, roughly from the turn of the century forward, are indeed operating in third spaces, but both of their own making and design, and, and as well as those found and positive. So what are these third spaces literally? How have they been imagined and sometimes literally produced, stage managed, or forged out of the circuits and serendipitous movements of fieldwork projects to find? In order for third spaces to be found, must they to some degree not be produced, elicited, as domains of speculative thinking alongside an increasingly defining uh, situations of field work. What are the variety of such moves and inventions? How are they conceived? And what do they pretend throughout the anthropological knowledge? And these are our questions. So third spaces are literally what can come from the negotiations within neoliberal collaborations and notions of interventions. So, I would have to, there's a sociology of third spaces if you want to be done. And I won't do that here, although when I'm thinking about this presentation, third sp spaces are, are, are literal. You do things. You, you, you construct, uh, shall we say, literal experiments in or alongside the kind of non-interventionist normative field work that we have classically done. It doesn't abolish it. It just does something else. And that something else arises in terms of intellectual problems, uh, also maybe interpersonal problems, I don't know, that emerge during field work. But what can be done? And we have, in the anthropological tradition, we have no models for this. And in fact, we have a kind of, we're wary of this, I think. The idea is you go, you're a participant observer, we see what happens, you develop relationships with people, right? But you're still the kind of master or mistress of your own uh, thoughts. Uh, that's what field notes are. They're incredibly contemplative, private kind of, not taking any of that away, but these are trials of concept in the field that have different levels of accessibility and they require different kind of imaginations of experiment. I'll mention, a I'll end with a couple, but I just wanted to talk about the sociology of third spaces. Depends very, this is a little bit more controversial. The development of these impinge upon current styles, mentalities of doing ethnography. And I just point out three today. One is the, and I'm not sure I can explain these well enough, but it's kind of interesting that uh, the style of ethnography today in terms of operating doing anthropology within global assemblages is very much invested in comparative alterity. And that is to draw things from the anthropological storehouse of knowledge, right? Very ontologically concerned, not so much epistemologically. And to explain contemporary events by classic anthropological concepts. 
right? And so alterity is a kind of value, and a kind of anthropologically instilled alterity. To some degree, its, it's object is a revitalization of a contemporary anthropological project, right? So the kind of concept work it wants to do with subjects, uh, or the kind of concept work it wants to do in third spaces is very much dedicated to these values. Second one is what came out of the 80s. Now orthodox, reflexive critique and class, out of classic critical theories. You might say Michael Fisher's statement of, he, he's, uh, statement of what a third space is that I just read to you comes out of this. Uh, it, it's informed by Benjamin, it's informed by Foucault, it's informed by a whole <laughs> tradition of doing uh, uh, classic, uh, of critical research and a tradition largely Western of uh, critical theory. Okay? Uh, and the third one is the one that I favor and won't have to go. It's a bit <coughs> eccentric in terms of the second, and it's, it's almost geared to the nth degree. It is giving the native point of view uh, a kind of authority in terms of your own work until it doesn't have any, <laughs> until you question that. It's, an, it's, it's alignment with the paraethnographic. And it's the argument that any critical argument or value that you could come up with somehow is expressed in the field of fieldwork and its complex relations. And you need to dig and find your way into that and align with it. Right? And it, you, could, it, you could wind up with some very, as you, you know, the, the cliche goes strange bedfellows for anthropology. And you play out the politics of it. And then you go as far as you can, and then eventually you come back to discussions in one or two. But it's deeply, deeply, it's the idea that you rely on the critical thinking of your subjects for your own critical thinking, right? And so each one, and that's the one I favor, and I could go on and on about it, because I, love, I like that one. But I want to say that for each one of these, you would have different strategies of constructing third spaces in the way that Fisher talked about. Okay? So just let me conclude, and because I don't want to leave some time for talking, I go on in this paper and just talk about uh, the modalities that we've been playing with as third spaces. And one is, you can't leave out uh, digital, digital affordances, dynamic archiving. A former student of mine who wrote uh, uh, Advocacy After Bhopal Kim Fortune and her partner have been working on asthma, and so they have something called asthmafiles.com, and very slowly they've been building the, the, uh, the uh, platform for doing this. And it's a complete back platform, open platform, for doing something like field work uh, digitally. And just call it archiving, because it accumulates, it has events, it has theory making elements. It's a very interesting thought out organism of occupying a third space. So there, there are a number of these. Anand Singh has one on Matsutsaki mushrooms, uh, not as well developed. It involves a very, very deep engagement <coughs> with the possibilities of technology and uh, hard to go, this, in terms of this relation of anthropology's collaboration, uh, collaboration with big projects, you can only go so far without patrons, without funding, without support. <laughs> so it's extremely interesting at what point it becomes, it develops kind of uh, collaborations, in this politics of collaboration I'm talking about. But dynamic archiving is one prominent one, and there's lots of stuff going on. Second are these things that we're playing with in the center, studios, labs, and parasites. And parasites literally are events within interventions, events of various sorts within fieldwork, within people's fieldwork projects to resolve certain kind of problems within them. And so literally they are, you know, they occur within a certain space, they're designed, et cetera, et cetera. Design thinking in this regard is a very interesting kind of tools to work with in thinking about how to do how to do these parasites and how they make sense. The third one are these very ambitious projects within projects, 
where the patron has an interest in what anthropology <coughs> can do for some form of humanitarianism, some form of, or often they need to know for business <laughs> what's going on. Uh, an example would be uh, the two that I deal with in this paper uh, is one by my colleague at, University, at UCI, uh, Bill Maurer, who's done a remarkable kind of work within the Gates Foundation and his own interest in mobile money. And it just ramifies into other organizations that are interested in this. So he's become a major uh, expert on this, but at the same time he's creating space for our students and for himself to do to what we, so it's this double agency in a way, but, a, but it's, it's rationales are very complex, it's not just the same thing. They, he argues with them in a way, with their own cultures in a way that anthropologists who insinuate themselves in certain structures so that they can do their thing often don't, right? So it's not a deception. It's, a, it's an indeed, it's an argument about the evolving nature of money and the idea that the, the, these ideas or these practices come from the bottom of the pyramid rather than the top. So it's a technology that's been designed by people all over the world and their diversity using cell phones in ways that people who manufacture cell phones <laughs> or uh, don't imagine. And so he's been occupying that space and has created an incredibly interesting space that's moved in all sorts of ways for what I would consider to be, in essence, and in its essence and design and tradition of the theological work. So, but it's a, it's it's a uh, it's an operation within an operation, right? It's a project within a project. It has to be presented in that way, right? It just can't be anthropology doing double agency. And another example that I contrast it with is Paul Rabineau's work. Uh, after doing field work in the way we understand it, uh, you know, with scientists, it, for his famous work on P PCR and French DNA, he became uh, the director in this huge project on synthetic biology. Big conglomerates, lots of funding, uh, an assemblage. Uh, he became the director uh, required by law of what is ethics, law, and social implications. And he did not want to just be a downstream person who would provide normative discourse for what the synthetic biologists were doing or trying to make themselves an engineer. He wanted to do what he did in his real fieldwork project. And so he came into conflict and got fired. <laughs> but he has written the most interesting books on uh, uh, essays and books for my from my point of view, on failure <laughs> that, I, you know, that I've ever read. So it's very instructive because he was trying to further a, he and I actually have the, uh, worked together and we've discussed the idea of parasites. He has his own little studio. And his idea was to forge this within the formal structures of these assemblages for that kind of thing. And he was just pushed back immediately. And so, he quit, but as I say, his failure has been fascinating learning experience for this kind of operating uh, as an anthropologist within these uh, projects. So I'm, what I mean by projects within projects are these uh, of doing uh, kind of amb ambitious level uh, field work uh, within larger Project. So it's the primary example of what I would call uh, this uh, in, in re responding to this imperative to collaborate today. So I think there's not going to be much time left unless I conclude. So can I, I'll just con uh, conclude with giving you those. <laughs> In this original paper, uh, I was getting kind of the revenge of writing culture. I, I ended without a conclusion, but simply with a quotation from the most, if not hated, controversial essay of writing culture 
by my former colleague, Stephen Tyler. Right? But he says, i uh, just use this quote to, to call, he says, a postmodern ethnography. Just let's call, just to change the term, forget postmodern. A, con a contemporary ethnography is a cooperatively evolved, uh, is a collaboratively evolved text consisting of fragments of discourse intended to evoke in the minds of both reader and writer an emergent fantasy of a possible world of common sense reality, and thus provoke uh, an aesthetic integration that will have a therapeutic effect. It is, in a word, poetry, not in its textual form, but in its return to the original context and function of poetry, which by means of its performative break with everyday speech, evoke memories of the ethos of community and thereby by provoke hearers to act ethically. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue that that is a prolegomenon <laughs> to third space. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, it's going to be, I'm not going to ask you a question, I'm just going to give you a little comment while you think about questions on it and I'll, you know, put you on the list. What is so interesting about this is it's exactly what it, Perhaps what I forgot in the introduction is that as you diagnose these things, you you give us all these new insights into what anthropology could be, and at the same time, I kind of find myself wondering whether you're not also criticizing them. You're, also, you're always, at any rate, emphasizing the paradoxical nature of those new advances that we make. So we never get to a place where critique gets us to a safe house, you know, no. from where, you know, now it's just getting on with anthropology. We always get into these new types of you know, double binds of, of paradoxes, of aporias that kind of haunt us every time, you know, even those exemplars that you mentioned. So it, yeah. it's very interesting that, you know, I, I, I find you have a very good uh, way of doing a diagnosis that is both, um, what is the word, uh, you know, optimistic, you know, that gives cause for optimism. We're actually going somewhere else that is interesting. And, but also kind of cautious, you know, cautions us against this idea that now we have an unassailable position, you know. Now I've moved away from the bad old guys and am in a new position from where, you know, I'm, I'm unassailable to new forms of critique. And I think you do that really well. Well, thanks. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I can just sort of say, for, in partial response in terms of the aesthetic of these, this sociology, uh, well, this third space is in terms of the three styles. Uh, I have to say, this is a personal confession in relation to what you just said. I'm totally bored with you, <laughs> right? And uh, I'm charged with a number of others to write a book on theory and anthropology and how it affects field work. And I'm trying as much as I can to hide my boredom with number two. Uh, I admire it, and I admire the learning of it, but I'm kind of personally bored with it. I don't do number one, but I feel extremely emotionally warm to it, right? Even though I don't think it's the right direction to go. <laughs> I think it's just a kind of revitalization movement of a sort. That's my pushy kind of way, but I, I love it. I, I warm to it emotionally. I'm bored by this. And, and the third one is something to do in the meantime. <laughs> no, I mean, the third one is really uh, learning new, uh, new things in the field and what to do with them anthropologically. Because I don't think the texts that we write give you much of an opportunity to develop what is learned paraphographically in the field, because these other two agendas uh, intervene. So this is what I'm saying. It's a bit eccentric, but I can engage eccentrism at my age. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, I thought even this last one, I thought there was something about what you said about the Baroque that, you know, was problematic with this one. But we can take that later. Fun? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot for a really good talk. Uh, I mean, I'm. I was thinking there's a way to combine number one and number three, uh, which is. Uh, I, I think uh, through a radicalization of your vision, uh, which really has to do with the fact that I think it would need leaving the idea of contemporary and ethnography into a much more virtual and futuristic version of uh, uh, ethnography. I mean, let me, uh, let me just give a, a, an analogy here uh, from uh, the Neolithics 
because that's where the combination comes into the picture with the traditional stuff and uh, this terror uh, stuff. I mean, there's this amazing site in uh, Ukraine, I think, from the Neolithics, where you have found um, all kinds of horse symbols. Yeah, you have found uh, paintings with horses with wings on them and saddles and God knows what, all kinds of horse images, but no horses. Yeah. There are no horses. These people have never had the horse, but, but they have images of horses everywhere. In other words, these people have conquered the world on horseback before the horse was even introduced to them. Yeah? And I think what is uh, implied in what you are dealing with here is a potentiality of anthropology that is not actualized yet, you know, or could not. I mean, the, the, the power of your vision is actually the the virtual potentiality rather than its contemporary ethnography. Do you see what I mean? Right. And and that's where labs and um, exhibitions or whatever gets becomes exciting because is there a way through which we stage or design our field sites and reveal a potentiality about humankind that is not yet actualized? Or if we talk about the anthropologist, uh, I mean, the multi-sided ethnography and the criticism raised against it, it has really, I think, to do with the simple fact that uh, we have to get rid of the human body, you know? I mean, the human body, which is actually the center of, in a way, of Malinowski fieldwork, that you kind of, you live out the lives of the natives through your own body, has to be killed, you know? In order for it actually to multiply itself in various sites simultaneously. I know it's science fiction, but on the other hand, that's the potentiality of, mm -hmm. of, of all this stuff, yeah? I mean, and that's where you link up with what I think I belong to, the number one comparative authority, personally, I belong to that one. But because that is exactly what shamans do, what magicians do, yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, you link a kind of futuristic vision to the most archaic of, uh, we know about mankind, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and that, I think, is the real power of, of your vision, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I love the connection. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, we're going to be <laughs> exploring it shortly. Exactly. In this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. I actually want to follow up on that. Because, um, I mean, I'm not sure how that, those third spaces are really, or some of them are really so different from the kind of anthropological work or ethnography that goes back 100 years. I mean, take, you know, like, Martha, Muslim votes. I don't think he was a shaman or anything, but that's comparative authority for you. You know, discussing the how, which is really a concept that comes from, Elton, I think, Eldon Best's work. Elton Best, yeah. And, you know, the Kula, which comes from Malinowski's work. So, ethnography or anthropology has been doing that for 100 years. And it would, as I see it, depend on somebody doing that paraethnographic work where you sit in the field, you do the long-term study, you interview people, you participate in their lives and you develop theory from those concepts that are sort of native or indigenous in a way, like the cooler, like how, and then somebody else may use them to elaborate on what is the social world or somebody else can we learn from that. So, I mean, how would you see those one and three being different today than they were 100 years ago? One and three? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm oh, dead bored with number two as well, so let's forget about that one. What's that? I'm dead bored with number two as well, so let's forget about that one. But number three is interesting. Uh, yeah, it, the, number number three depends on who you're who you're working with. It, let's say you're you're working on on uh, you're working with uh, like in red the carbon markets. You're working with economists, or you're working with thinkers who are informed by the domination of economistic models. And the idea for us is to blow them off because. Uh, they can't be right. <laughs> it won't work, even though it has the prestige of, of, you know, it carries prestige. What I'm arguing is uh, uh, you have to find spaces, spaces of which I sort of say simple. Now, it could wind up being the traditional position of anthropology in this way. You find the where alterity is, you know, it's in terms of village cultures or cultures on the ground. And you learn those and you sort of bring them back metaphorically as critiques of mm -hmm. 
policy or, or something like that. I'm just sort of saying that kind of work has to be, can't be done by the anthropologist saying, being obstructive in the usual way and saying, it's not so, it's not going to work. It has to be, it's kind of political work back through the models mm -hmm. in play. <coughs> and that requires the kind of mapping of a kind of <coughs> ground of field work, which is quite different than the traditional one. If you come from one, I think, like I say, my heart is in one. <laughs> I, I love the idea that actor network theory is all about animus. I mean, I love that idea. It's, a, it's an exciting idea. But that's because I come out of the culture of anthropologists. I think it's, you could go somewhere with that idea, but you have to make it go somewhere. You can't just offer it. <clears throat> you have to essentially <clears throat> create a third space trial <clears throat> or experiment. Exactly. So, in some ways, uh, I'm much more into form than, mm. I, I don't like form versus content, but I'm much more into what kind of forms work. And I think the ideal field which thinks this, even though it has lots of problems of its own, practices are design practices of various sorts. So I'm not saying that that's an absolute model for anthropology. In fact, you get into a lot of trouble when anthropologists and design people talk. But I think that, that space is a very interesting one to think about for doing kind of ethnographic trials or if you want to experiment. Can I just continue on it? It's just, sure. Are they really to sort of research or writing styles or styles of presentation of how you develop your work? I mean, I mean, I, I, I can be usually confused about the notion of third space here, actually. Um, right. Yeah, I understand how, this time. It's good. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so it's just a I have to answer? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to answer. It's just a push the concept, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> It's not, I don't want to be the prophet of forget the book, <laughs> it's now all performance art. <laughs> or it's now, you know, the performance art is Sabbath. Or it's now all uh, 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 visual forms which circulate. Although I do think there should be a lot more of that in, in the ethnographic uh, production than, than there is. So I'm not quite sure. You know, the parasite is, it can simply be special contexts within fieldwork that are kind of meta upon it. So the idea is to clarify certain emergent conflict concepts by collective speculative thinking. What you might call, and has occurred in certain kinds of anthropology, a seminar in the field, right? These, pre but not to clarify a point that ought then fits into a number two or even a number one, but actually creates the product of fieldwork, the thinking. Now, what is done? This would appeal to Tim Ingle. What appeals? What makes it anthropology rather than ethnography? Depends upon what you do with that stuff. But in, in a way, when I'm talking from his point of view, I'm talking about a kind of ethnography that could serve a reconstituted project of anthropology, right? And not just, re re I'm not engaged in that, but does not reticulate. So I think his project, or his complaint about ethnography not being anthropology requires exactly these third spaces. But I'm quite literal, they're kind of performative. They, you, you think of the range. The parasite is typically, could be some kind of game, could be some sort of uh, design making, something or other, could be a seminar. In the graduate student projects in which we have done parasites, there are actually clarifications of certain kinds of thinking in the production of a, with an apprentice work, mm. in which really, in which their thinking has to be differentiated from, in the paraethnographic sense, from the natives' thinking. Mm. And that's what uh, parasites do. But the, it's not just meeting with the professor, the natives are included. Mm -hmm. But it's, it depends on how it's designed. Mm -hmm. So we had one dealing with uh, 
we do a lot of criminology at uh, UCI through the ethnographic. So we had one that dealt with uh, prisoners. There are a lot of projects, but never with uh, uh, parole officers and prisoners together. So we he designed maybe three events that introduce these kinds of discussions, plus the leading professors of criminology. And so this generated all sorts of discussion and discourse of a very mundane and a very, you know, sophisticated nature that became the uh, basis for the uh, framework of his dissertation. If it hadn't been this, it would have been Foucault all the way down. <laughs> it would have been Foucault all the way down, plus I went to the field, I saw this, I did this, and it corresponds to uh, yeah. So there's this need for mediating concepts that come from the field itself. So that's Theodore. Yes. Um, I was wondering about uh, if you could say something about uh, ethnographic research as an uh, aspiration um, and uh, in the context of its. Um, Let's say that an aspiration with an impact on uh, on mediation and translation, for instance, the existence of this this uh, aspiration. Uh, let's say not going so far as uh, Agamben did with his uh, idea of philo uh, history of philosophy. Philosophy would be the history of things that never happened, uh, because philosophical ideas don't happen; they're aspirational, uh, and, uh, and according to him, philosophers don't exist in reality. I think. Anthropologists exists in reality in the sense that philosophers don't. But still, the aspirational element of, of ethnography uh, can have some real impact in terms of uh, actually triggering mediation and, uh, and uh, translation between uh, groups that otherwise would not have this kind of exchange, as you just mentioned, between in, in, in that parasite experiment. Yeah. So, uh, and because when you talked about um, uh, fieldwork, uh, I mean, uh, uh, fieldwork diaries, I felt in a way that, yes, this, there was an anticipation of ethnography going on, but also a postponement, and also a guileful postpone Indeed. postponement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, this is very rich. This mediated, mediating function, dealing with the aspirational, the idea that field notes uh, uh, Tausig writes about field notes. He has an interesting article on field notes that he did for Documenta. You send it to me. Mm -hmm. But one of the best observations was that how many of us write ethnographies without ever referring to the field notes? <coughs> so the field notes is kind of a, 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 a sacred archive of just this kind of stuff mm -hmm. that does not necessarily. Uh, 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 I, the intention of taking field notes is to create our form of data. But what it really is, is creating this kind of <clears throat> aspirational thinking. But it remains very, uh, often very, not uh, very internal, like inter you know, uh, internal discourse. Um, anyhow, I don't know. I mean, you have maybe a better discussion of the aspirational aspects, but I, yeah. Well, uh, I, I guess that, um and maybe sometimes uh, the aspirational aspect is what makes ethnography, ethnography uh, happen uh, whenever the, uh, the relationship between different actors is conceptualized in terms of a space, that is a third space. So in some sense, the third space comes to salvage ethnography under the current conditions somehow. Um, a kind of factitious space where, where there are elements that are, uh, let's say, uh, managed, real, staged, and so forth, and, and a number of, uh, let's say, um, aspirational elements that together uh, bring people together around notions that, uh, that for one could be, let's say, uh, entirely fictional, where for the other ones it would uh, trigger real action. And uh, the anthropologists hold, hold these two things together somehow. Uh, not only in the, ethnographic, in the ethnographic discourse, but in this kind of sonography that you've been developing, the parasite and these alongside uh, <coughs> perspectives, or the third space. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but so, how would this be presented? Uh, I'm also a kind of politician in my own discipline. So, how would this be presented as a project within 
uh, I mean, for many people, it is, who cares whether it's anthropology or not? It's interesting. Mm -hmm. But I, for this purpose, it's in terms of anthropology creates opportunities for the production of this kind of work. Mm -hmm. How would this be rhetorized? Uh, 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 how would this be expressed as a kind of anthropological project? That's, that's the thing I would, I would be interested in. How would it be taught? Mm -hmm. How would it generate a document other than the dissertation mm -hmm. that, that we have? Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's easier to teach it to, uh, to uh, um, ethnography students and design students together. Yeah. Rather than each uh, by themselves, because it draws on both uh, disciplines somehow. Yeah. I mean, the, the, when I speak to anthropology audiences, it's the thing to persuade people is this is not just a, a, another, this is a thing, mm -hmm. that, you know, anthropology is very diverse. I'd like to make the argument that it's a, it, it affects its core traditional ways of thinking about doing field work. Uh, and it has, deals with the problems of not the virtues of what we do when we do field work, but establishing field work in the world. Mm. Mm. Creating it in the world. Right? And for some kind of projects, in, in these three styles, it's not a problem. And it's it continues to be rich in the way that it was always rich. For other kind of projects that have been touched by science, you know, uh, these uh, other uh, uh, post-2000 projects, I would say, or post-90s projects, it does matter. It matters It matters a lot. So you turn to uh, fortune. So it depends on what your actual stakes are. That's why I took the time to lay out this kind of crude, these three, these three styles. Lima? <laughs> Sitting in the back and trying to follow the discussion. But so it may be that what I'm saying is already said. I'm a bit unsure about that. But um, it relates to what the question that Stephen asked about, about the, these the three different types of anthropological endeavors. And I was just thinking that isn't it so that the first one, no, isn't it so that it all has to do with the role of concepts? Because as I see the first one, it's anthropology talking to anthropology. So it's a very circular or more. Um, you, mean the first, or you mean the first one? Yes, uh, what's going on is anthropology talking to anthropology as I see it. It's a monade, it's a circular movement. And the next one is a diary because anthropology is pointing out to somebody else. What's wrong with them? I would say so. The role of concepts is very pointing, or uh, kind of that, that's what we use our concepts for. And I would say the third one is a triad because it's anthropology talking with somebody else, and the role of the concept, the concept becomes the third partner because um, I've been engaged in a field work with uh, some private companies. And um, the kind of concepts that I had to use, I was working with a philosopher, the kind of concepts that I had to use were not anthropological concepts. I had to talk about walls, for instance. Walls and beehives, in order for them to understand what I was talking about, and they used these concepts for themselves to develop their company structure. But we kind of met somewhere in between in a very, um, more ambivalent, less, I couldn't control what was going on. They used it for their own purpose. But um, there was, as you were talking, this mediating figure in between us. So it was a, a different kind of relationship than the other two. Um, Perfect example so three. The idea, the idea is how to gain control of it. It, it sounds a bit like struggle uh, for your own purposes. And what and I'm saying that the third space is in the ability to sort of create them somewhere, somehow, alongside or within. It's gaining this kind of, through collaboration, but collaborations that work for you and not being part of collaborations that work for, so how you achieve this from exactly the situation you're talking about and how it can become really interesting as anthropology. Anthropology, as we like to discuss it and have always known it, and it could bleed suddenly in that 
task bleed into two or one. I'm not, I'm just sort of saying that this third one is kind of eccentric in, in that it goes as deep as possible. It gives as much anthropological value that we share to the concepts of others before we come back to two or one. It really allows you to explore the ideas of others before you assimilate them to one and two. But it also does some other fairly weird things because people, with all due respect, it, there's some very interesting thinking going on in these kind of neoliberal, I, I call them neoliberal because I'm, I, not as a, uh, a conduct, condemning word, there's some kind of interesting thinking that goes on. Maybe wrong, maybe values may be bad, something like that, but the thinking is, the questions are often good ones. So you might sort of say that you want to develop a kind of uh, a diagnostic or program of question asking the right questions, or the questions that are uh, framed in terms of the way they're working in the world through number three before you operate through one or two. But that's kind of, art of, uh, kind of artificial. I don't think that comparative al alterity is, uh, that project is an enclosed project. I just yeah. think its values are connected to a, a kind of revitalization of anth anthropological thinking. But it's very open to thinking about these things uh, as, uh, uh, and their license to do so are all these kind of new science, technology, and business, new ontologies, new ways of, of uh, that really that new technologies promote. So that it's, an, it's a kind of opportunity to think kind of weirdly, mm. uh, exotically, if you want, mm. about think, you know, Disruptions of the common sense world, mm. and comparable terity does it. So it's a, it, it's dangerous is that it just really reticulates as a, a kind of anthropological discussion. Mm. You know, there are certain brilliant people, and there are commentaries on those kinds of things. And so it's more like this. It's it's it's, it's after. It's not it's not trying to revitalize universal theories of, uh, of mythology or anything. It's actually trying to look at new objects, but it's absolutely tied to the value of a, 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 a certain kind of concept, and very agilely and inventively reinvents those concepts and new thinking about them for very contemporary kind of situations. And I don't, I'm just bored by two, but I want to sell it short. It is the great tradition, right? Uh, it, uh, it, it, you know, uh, and so people that really are engaged with it really know how to, the tradition of social and cultural theory ultimately must be, it must, this theory <coughs> must be redeemed to two eventually. Mm -hmm. It's just that I don't want to pay attention to it now myself and want to think independently about, it's the kind of thinking of uh, kind of, insta, you know, to the extent that installation artists or theater people do any kind of research in theory for what, they produce, this is more like, this is my romantic view of the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think the tricky bit is, is that we think we should choose one for the other because I wouldn't have been satisfied with what I did when I did that thing with the companies had I not had the other two as possibilities. Yeah. I mean, so uh, there's a lot of fancy things going on in the tree-like way of doing it, which is not satisfying to me because uh, I also like to return to the comparative alterity, strange, weird movement of uh, new inspiration. I also at times like to reflect upon the material I have in a more critical way. So in a way, the strength of anthropology is actually that the three somehow work together. I would say so. <laughs> um, Theoretically, they work together. Yeah. <laughs> In reality, people live and die figuratively by their commitments. Mm -hmm. And uh, each one of these three involve uh, certain kinds of commitments, which I absolutely agree with you. We, we mustn't sort of say they're closed boxes. They don't, they're not mutually exclusive. But style does matter. Mm -hmm. And what motivates people in doing their ethnographic research, and I don't think there's enough articulation of what the styles are. Mm. It's sort of like we all do the same, we mm. all do field work, we, we teach people a, a kind of uh, way of life, uh, a research life. 
But I do think that at any point in time, there's, there's st there, there are definite styles in play. And I, I want to argue that even though I agree, they're not mutually exclusive. At the end of the day, we should think of them all as interwoven. But in terms of the stakes, mm -hmm. what drives people into mm -hmm. the film, mm -hmm. these are distinctive motivations. Mm -hmm. Is that you know? Okay, thanks. I want to, to be a bit nostalgic and invite you to reflect upon what we lose by this development. Because we know when you, when you give your diagnosis like multi-sidedness, it affects what we do. So, and when something like that is invented, something else dies. So I would like, I would like you to, to say something about with this. The, you've talked about the imperative to, to collaborate. What is it that we lose by by having that imperative or that impulse to collaborate. For example, in my, if where I do research, we are, we cannot get grants if we do not collaborate with Ugandan researchers. Yes. And, um, and other forms of collaboration, interdisciplinary collaborations, often also is a condition for getting grants. And I, I appreciate all the positive aspects of this. But, but maybe a little bit of a reflection about what we lose by that. And also, I would like you to, to talk a little bit more about the imperative to intervene for intervention and for our relevance, that research is relevant for some you know, larger scale societal uh, development. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too tired. <laughs> No, but uh, you're, talking, you're, you're, you're implying that there's a, a certain valuable way in which anthropologists are working, have worked, that it's a that, that involves a certain kind of regime that invites them in and leaves them a, 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 enough space to do interesting and useful things in places that they have traditions of study. And there's, uh, we're not losing, I don't think we're losing that. Uh, I think there are many careers that unfold uh, in this way. I don't think the major, uh, maybe writing culture or that mm -hmm. moment, if not responsible for it, mark the shift. I don't think the way the discipline sort of uh, talks to itself about what it does is in alignment with that mm. so much anymore. And that could be regret. Mm -hmm. But I don't, think, I don't think that matters to people doing this kind of work. They're just doing it. I mean, it's a question of uh, the you know, reigning ideologies of the fields in certain moments, which I don't think are just a matter of self-image. I do think it uh, matters what's done and who, who, who does what. I think that what you're talking about is really preserved by the way, at least in the United States, people come into anthropology. When I came into anthropology, I had very little experience in the world. And sort of anthropology gave me an opportunity to experience the world. In graduate programs of anthropology now in the United States, we generally accept uh, the most competitive people are people who have projects in mind. But it's not the nature of the project, it's the experience they have in mind it's somewhere, or a commitment they have in mind to work somewhere, shall we say in Africa, Asia, or something in that kind of background. And essentially, the training that we give them is a kind of the tools, the way of thinking, and they go back <coughs> and they work in, in become part of what they already were. So we. The, the typical graduate student now is not, so, or they might change, that anthropology is wonderful in allowing for that. But there's a certain structure in the way the discipline reproduces itself now, at least in that segment that I, that, that I know, that, I'm, I'm, I'm going around to your question, I, uh, that does not, what, I, what you're referring to as lost does not get lost. No. It's very, anthropology turns out to be a very open, wonderful, exciting, I love it, but a, in a sense a very, maybe wisely conservative discipline. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard in, since Malinowski, 
uh, to change the way anthropologists think of themselves as doing things, because these are, are, are normative commitments. They're not just what's right and what's wrong. It's really what what suits me, what's valuable. It's almost religious. And and I and that can and that's very hard that's very hard to shake. So I would argue that even in terms of what I'm arguing, it's not some sort of avant-garde elite uh, kind of thing, because no, I think the conditions of working in the world are changing. But I don't think the essential values that you're talking about are actually being lost, or would be lost by this kind of thing. I think um, it is time to wrap up. I enjoyed this talk very much, in particular this idea that anthropology is baroque at the moment. Oh. Many nooks and crannies. I'm sure there are many more nooks and crannies that people want to explore. But I suggest we go next door, those of you who can and want to, and explore the nooks and crannies there. Um, thank you very much. George.